Uh, good afternoon, hello everyone. Uh, we are glad to have in this Zoom meeting session to Gustavo Silva. Uh, Gustavo is a young researcher interested in the evolutionary forces that promote diversification in plant species uh, during the colonization of new environments. He performs a multidisciplinary approach combining tools from population genomics with a uh, niche modeling and especially explicit analysis. Uh, Gustavo is from Colombia, in, where he studied biology and focused uh, his career in plant biology and the study of the diversity of Andean flora. Uh, he also did a master program uh, with emphasis in systematics and um, performed a biogeographical approach to study the colonization process of a subtropical tree species into the North Andean forest through the Panama Isthmus. Uh, afterwards, uh, Gustavo moved to Brazil to enroll in a PhD in genetics. Uh, for his thesis, uh, Gustavo performed a landscape genetics project to understand the process of colonization of coastal environments of wild petunia species. Currently, Gustavo holds a postdoc position in the population genetics group of the Technical University in Munich, in Germany, where he is developing a project to detect selection signals in wild tomato species uh, related with recent parallel colonization process uh, to harsh and highly variable environments around the Atacama Desert. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk a, a bit about the presentation today. The title of the talk is uh, Wild Tomato Ecological Genomics, Elucidating Adaptation Process to a Stressful Environment. Uh, Gustavo, this is your space. Thank you for accepting this, inv this invitation. Um, please, can you share your screen, uh, your presentation in a full screen mode? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andres. And uh, also thank you to uh, Lucio and Chelsea to organize this NI seminar series. And a uh, special thanks to Andres to uh, invite me and give me the opportunity to show my work here. So let's uh, share the screen uh, now to start my presentation. Um, so it is working now. Yes, it's working. So, thank you. So um, hello, everybody. Um, I will uh, present um, several results that I have doing uh, here uh, in Munich uh, in a research line about um, population genomics and using uh, as a model uh, a wild tomato species that is uh, Solano chilense. So first of all, I will just uh, present our uh, species model. I guess through the, all the um, seminars today is the first time that we will focus uh, in a single species. So let's hope you find interesting and you can say me at the end if, if the species deserves this amount of attention and, and resources. So uh, Solanum chilense, uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, as a, a wild tomato species, a wild relative tomato species. Uh, it's part of the clade of the auto-incompatible uh, species of, of the clade. And also, interestingly, this species is the southernmost uh, distributed species of the, of the whole clade. Um, this species has been studied uh, before, and uh, the studies show it that uh, the species have a, a strong uh, genetic structure, uh, having like a, um, four main uh, infraspecific lineages that you can see here in purple, red, uh, green, and blue. Um, uh, and this, uh, this uh, uh, genetic structure uh, have several like, correlations with different uh, environmental features, uh, topographical uh, and also some um, morphological features of the species. So as I mentioned you, Solanum chilense is distributed uh, uh, in the southern part of the whole plate uh, that is uh, uh, have a, a very characteristic of a very dry uh, environment and also the species occupies 
or are distributed in a quite a wide em a environmental gradient from coastal to a height in the in the Andes uh, uh, above the 3,000 meters above sea level. So if you can see here, um, besides of this like a uh, geographical uh, perspective, we, we can see the distribution of, of Solanum chilense uh, in uh, environmental uh, dimension, let's say, and compare it with other Solanum uh, and, and other wild tomatoes. And you can see that this is like a, a Solanum chilense occupies a very specific or specialized um, a, a part of the of the environmental space, uh, sharing some uh, like qualm um, uh, for for very dry habitats, similar to Solanum penelae and, and Peruvianum, but uh, with uh, lower uh, temperatures that that is re uh, related with the, this southernmost uh, distribution of the species. So we can see here again this uh, geographic distribution and in, in this uh, geographic um, gradient here from north uh, uh, from southern Peru to to northern Chile. Uh, this distribution uh, the environment here changed from dry or messy habitats in these areas of the of the red group to uh, hyper uh, arid uh, areas in the especially in the in the Andean highlands. If we see this distribution of these same dots in a an, in, in an environmental uh, space, uh, we will see this here uh, that um, all the the this the, there is like a, a white spread distribution or environment of this uh, central group of the of the of the group of the uh, of the of the red uh, populations. Uh, this north. So, uh, northern populations are kind of merged inside the environment or, or the environment is very similar to the central group while the two more divergent groups in the south, the coastal ones, uh, seems to be more marginal uh, in, in this environmental space and, and, the, and the highland group uh, completely differentiated here. This, this is a basic PCA of many, many uh, climatic variables uh, that includes uh, this bioclim data set uh, from Chelsea, but also some another uh, data, data from or variables from solar derived from solar radiation, topography, and cloud to try to incorporate as much as possible variables to distinguish the environmental niche of the species. So, using uh, a subset of these uh, variables, I just um, perform an habitat suitability model. So, this is um, a, like a very standardized uh, method that uh, we use um, in, in an assemble approach of uh, many different algorithms uh, of niche modeling. And, and we can, um, uh, after fit uh, the models that a predict the presence or absence uh, uh, of the species in uh, uh, taking into account these climatic variables. We can project in, in a space the models and we can see these uh, gradients of suitability or probability of the distribution of the species uh, in the space. And we can also check which regions are more, have like a more favorable uh, environment for, for the species. So as we can see here, this central region had the higher suitability uh, values and uh, in the south we can see uh, like a few spots of environmental uh, suitable uh, places. But for example, here in the, in the, in the, in the highlands, um, the suitability scores uh, are quite uh, lower here. That makes sense because uh, we can, as, we, as I show you in the PCA, these um, environments here are quite different to the main or to the core distribution of the species. So one of the nice things uh, of this uh, habitat suitability model is that we can project to some uh, past or future scenarios of the species to uh, construct some hypotheses uh, uh, of the like the change the uh, changes on the ranges and also some uh, diversification processes. Uh, so we, uh, as you can see in the big map on the left, uh, um, this is a, a consensus map 
of the projection of the of the of the suitability model under four different um, scenarios or models uh, for the last glacial maximum. Uh, we can see here uh, like a, a lot of uh, incongruence areas uh, projected for the different models. That's why it's very important to, to project to more than one model because if we keep the, the projection to the past in a single model, we can ju uh, just infer many different histories that uh, could be not well supported. So the, the yellow areas here in the projection to the past are the areas that are uh, like a, in a majority consensus of all the projections. And we can see here that um, it's likely that the species uh, suffer like a, a restriction of the distribution during the, during the glacial maximum um, towards the, the coast and the central and north region of the current uh, distribution. And all of the, the like the um, records or the distribution in the highland areas uh, uh, are not like predicted to be present uh, in the past. So um, these kind of um, projections to the past are not like um, conclusive evidence, but uh, it's very uh, useful to generate different hypotheses of the how uh, the species changes in the range and how is the relationship with the diversification and an adaptation process uh, towards the, the, um, the, the, the history of the species. So this is the basic uh, framework that uh, um, I apply here for in our work. So basically uh, we try to infer what are, are the, the distribution, the present and past distribution of the species and try to understand how uh, is the relationship between these climatic and landscape features in some demographical processes uh, like uh, colonization processes or um, expansion processes that could lead to the diversification in some infra infra specific uh, lineages and that will shape different um, depending on how is the the, the real scenario uh, it will shape different uh, polymorphisms or genetic diversity signatures that uh, we need to use to, to to recover or to understand how are the uh, adaptation processes and which are the mechanisms, the genetic mechanisms involved in the adaptation to, to the uh, environments, to the new environments during the colonization process. So first let's talk about, about the species divergence. And there are some uh, works done um, trying to understand these processes and the most likely divergence uh, scenario is that the species diverse from uh, Solanum peruvianum. Uh, Solanum peruvianum is a wide distributed species in the coastal of, uh, of Peru and a little part of the north Chile. And, and it's likely that uh, the Solanum chilense diverse from some marginal from some marginal populations of, of Solanum peruvianum and the current estimations or the estimation in, in, in this specific work it was around uh, 1.2 to 1.4 million uh, generations, uh, generations ago. And this is also interesting to, to check if there is some possibility of, of what is the more likely scenario of divergence if there is a still a, a gene flow between the two species. So uh, to answer these questions, we dig uh, about um, these patterns using uh, whole genome sequences. So basically we um, um, applied different methods to understand this uh, or to estimate this was the, the likely scenario of the divergence between Solanum chilensia, Solanum peruvianum, and if there is uh, some signals of secondary contact or um, past or current migration between the species and um, the different uh, um, estimations that we got of the divergence uh, dates uh, we, we found like a little bit like some discrepancies between the different methods uh, that uh, with estimates from um, 0.6 or 0.7 million years ago to a maximum of uh, 1.4 mi uh, uh, 
million years ago or generations here. So we can see here that uh, it's a little bit hard to, to really get a confident uh, estimation of the divergence um, time, especially because we need to really understand how if there are some uh, migration involved or not. Of course, for example, this uh, method that doesn't take into account the migration uh, is likely to have uh, lower um, estimations. Um, <clears throat> Using these different uh, scenarios or models, uh, we use them to to um, uh, 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 get like some intervals or or polymorphisms data to to understand what is the the, the differentiation patterns under neutrality uh, uh, of the two species, and from that we just run uh, different uh, coalescence simulations to get like an interval of the genome wide. Uh, differentiation and to try to catch some possible uh, genes or regions in the genome that are uh, behave like an outliers and could explain uh, the, the divergence processes between the two species. So in this specific uh, work um, uh, we found some uh, a set of genes that uh, were, um, were enriched with, with some uh, functional uh, um, with functional enrichment of post uh, embryonic uh, uh, development. So maybe uh, um, it could be related uh, uh, with some uh, incompatibility between the two species to, to develop uh, the, the embryo and the, and, the, and the seeds, but this is something that uh, still is um, unclear for us. So we also check or dig in, uh, more into this possibility of the post-divergence gene flow between the two species. Uh, and using these um, ABABA related methods, uh, we found that uh, like this is uh, quite low or, 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 or uh, the signals of uh, genome-wide uh, gene flow or these two between uh, Solanuchil and Semperoviano are, are weak. But still, uh, we can find some um, significant signals uh, in uh, involved always uh, the coastal population of Osolano Chilense. So every time that we, we uh, run pathways uh, analysis, uh, um, the, the coastal populations uh, show up uh, some signals of admixture with uh, with uh, Solano Peruvian. So um, now we can uh, focus uh, in the in the infraspecific uh, differentiation processes and the demography of the species. So the first attempt that we did, uh, we run uh, or we perform like a two parallel um, appro uh, approx uh, approximations to understand the species history. Uh, the first one uh, uh, that you can see on the left here uh, was based on uh, whole genome sequencing. Uh, basically, we take uh, one individual per group of this population, the central, the coastal, and the and highland, and we try to estimate uh, the population or, or the, the effective population sizes and the, and the divergence uh, uh, using one approach of uh, the sequentially Markovian coalescent. Basically, it um, uh, check the polymorphisms along along the um, the genome, and it try to infer the different trees or uh, or uh, the most common antecessor on each side of the of the um, of the genome, and relate with the with the pos or possible recombination or haplotype blocks that are there, and depending of the length of the haplotypes and the length of the of the trees there, uh, it can infer the population sizes and uh, and the um, and, and when we compare between the population, it can, it can infer um, the, um, the divergence times at, well, that we can see here uh, is that the most likely scenario uh, is that there are the, the colonization of the South uh, happens through two independent processes. Uh, one first to, uh, towards the coast and the other one towards the, um, towards the highland. 
uh, in, and also in uh, different times. It looks like the diversification of the coastal populations occurs first than the highlands. The highland is more recent and the difference between them, it could be around uh, one um, order of magnitude in the, in the, of time. We also applied um, approximate Bayesian computation. So basically with that, uh, we uh, uh, um, check the polymorphisms and different population statistics in many genes. In that case, 91 genes uh, related with pathogen uh, resistance and uh, uh, 14 populations. So this is a more comprehensive, comprehensive uh, sampling here. And we can uh, take into account uh, possible uh, like gene um, population structure and migration between the populations that is uh, not considered in the, in the SMC approaches. And with that, we compare the, how likely are different uh, divergence models here, like for example, this model one that is the independent uh, divergence of the, of the um, North coast and south groups from the, from the central and this other alternative hypothesis that were the mountain uh, derived from the coast or vice versa. And we found like a, a good approach, uh, support to the, this uh, independent um, diversification or uh, um, diversification process, yeah. Uh, the nice thing of this approach um, is that, that, or in this specific work, uh, is that uh, uh, at the beginning we was looking for uh, uh, identify some specific uh, NLR genes that could be morbid uh, uh, or have like some positive uh, selection signals that could be related with the uh, colonization to new environments there. Uh, but instead of that, uh, we found something more uh, interesting in this case. Uh, that uh, was uh, some signals of uh, complete in the core evolution uh, in these colonization processes. So basically uh, what uh, we found here is that some uh, specific genes that could be more um, central in, the, in, in this specific network of pathogen resistance that, we, that are, is expected to be very conserved and presents uh, um, signals of purifying selections uh, it, uh, show up as an outliers when we compare uh, populations from different regions, regions from the central, coastal, or, or highland. Uh, while uh, when we compare populations inside the regions, uh, we found more layers uh, related uh, with uh, peripheral genes uh, that could be related with more like fine tuning uh, the, um, the the adaptation of the of the organ the individuals or populations to more specific environments inside the the um, uh, the regions. So this network evolution it was also assessed in, in, in other works in Solanum Chilense. So in this case, Catarina Gondel um, assessed uh, some uh, uh, population genetic polymorphisms in sixteen abiotic resist. Uh, stress uh, genes, and they also found some different signals in the polymorphins, especially in, in the, the polymorphins of uh, comparing synonymous versus non-synonymous between different populations, and they showed that some uh, functional genes versus regulatory genes show as a completely different uh, polymorphins um, patterns there. So basically after these results, we was uh, completely like uh, convinced that we want to understand or try to identify some network evolution uh, in this uh, colonization pro process towards the south and these uh, different environments, very dry uh, environments. So um, the way that we start approaching that it was uh, using a population genomics approach uh, uh, um, and using whole genome uh, sequence data. So um, we sequence uh, six different populations and in, in five individuals in each population. So if you can see here the, the starts, so we, we sequence five individuals in two populations here in the central coast, in the central 
um, region, another one from the central group, but uh, marginal, submarginal, uh, one in here in the in the highland and two in the coast. So after uh, um, with with um, this uh, data, we map the the reads to Solanum penelae genome, and we identify uh, the variants there, and, and we found this basic uh, genetic uh, structure here that uh, is like uh, all the uh, the, the main pattern that we found here is that the two coastal populations are very well differentiated against the other and against themselves. So it's just uh, completely differentiated populations and also uh, the highland populations are, are well differentiated and we found like some um, gradient here of differentiation between the two uh, populations that are from the central group but located in, in, the, in the highlands. So from that we identify it uh, for each population around two million SNPs there. But the interesting thing that I want to show you here um, is the amount of unique SNPs that, uh, for example, is really high in the two coastal populations. So it's showing that this differentiation in these two populations is higher, uh, regardless that they have like less variation in total. Also, as uh, uh, it was found by Katharina Bondel, there is a lot of non-synonymous mutations here. Uh, and, and, and also interesting here is uh, that we have in, in Solanum chilense a very high um, variant rate that we can found around uh, 30 SNPs per KB. So using this data, we try to find like uh, or detect some positive selection signals or hard sweeps. Uh, the way that uh, with that is basically we uh, study the polymorphins or or the structure of the haplotypes alongside the genome and all that regions that are outliers or basically have like different behavior from the genome white um, patterns uh, are uh, like selected from there and we. On, like we use different statistics, one based on the site frequency spectrum or the linkage disequilibrium or from the haplotype um, patterns there. And from uh, using these approaches here for each population, um, uh, we uh, identify different like genomic windows that uh, behave like uh, outliers in any of these statistics, for example, in this Example here in this table, you can see that the outlier windows uh, in these two methods, the CLR and the Omega, based on the polymorphins data. Um, uh, we just merge these uh, um, um, results from the two approaches, uh, trying to find which uh, the overlap regions uh, where the windows, the, the outlier windows, appear in, in the genome. And, and from that, identify which genes are present in this in the region. So interestingly, the two coastal populations here uh, present very low or, uh, amount of uh, or, uh, or, um, overlap or layer, or layer windows compared to the other populations, but a, a comparable amount of genes. So that could show initially like some possible cluster of genes that are under selection or some possible um, structural variants or inver big inversions that can uh, show uh, up in this outlier analysis. Just to verify, we just calculate uh, the genome wide and the um, and the uh, and the uh, some statistics from these candidate genes. In that case, the nucleotide uh, diversity and the TGMSD, and we can see here that uh, for all the candidates, the, the um, the, um, the statistics are lower, that confirms that there is like a different signals there. Uh, so from that, I say uh, like uh, still the, there is like a, a lot of uh, uh, data to, to process and to find like some uh, pattern that we still need to dig a little bit more in the data. So the first is uh, a one this like uh, a standard analysis that is the functional enrichment of all that uh, genes that uh, uh, we found in the within the outlier windows, and for example, I can show you with the, the, our approach now is try to um, filter or, or try to check 
uh, like uh, by groups of genes that could be uh, in, in, inside the or involved in similar or in the same pathways or gene network. So I can just show uh, you one example here, which was just one uh, set of, uh, of genes that were in, enriched in photoperiodins, flowering or circadian reading that uh, show it's like a, a high enrichment in the two, in two highland populations. This is just uh, one example. And from using that uh, that specific uh, genes, the, poly the polymorphins there, we just um, uh, try to apply this uh, genotype environment association analysis to try to see if there are some group of specific genes or polymorphins that show some correlated uh, allele frequencies or, or polymorphins in some populations that are really different to the others, and also that could be uh, that show some correlation with some specific um, environmental uh, variables. So this is the like uh, the, the the world that we still have now. Uh, so we expect to to finish and try to to find like some. And, uh, like interesting signals in a JIT network level. But to complete this, this work here about the JIT network evolution, we also need to know uh, uh, or, 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 or relate the polymorphins uh, outlier uh, signals that we that provide you provide us um, some outliers or some positive uh, possible positive selections with some uh, positive, uh, possible structural variation signals. So basically we take the same uh, genome data and we, um, genome-wide data, and we um, try to identify some possible uh, structural variations in, in these populations. Uh, so basically trying to, to, to detect uh, uh, big uh, insertions, deletions, or, or, or inversions in, in the genome that could be also enriched with these specific uh, genes that uh, could be involved in the adaptation to the new environments here. So the first um, result that I want to show you here is the, the frequency of the, of the different uh, structural variants that we uh, found in these specific cases, uh, insertions and, and deletions. And as you can see here, uh, like this decay on, in, in the frequencies suggesting that uh, most of these structural variants that we identified has uh, have um, like an, a neutral um, signal there. Uh, that this is quite uh, interesting here. Uh, so we need to really differentiate which of these structural variations uh, have no impact in the fitness of uh, and could be like really neutral and which of them could be really involved in, in, uh, in with genes with a uh, related with positive uh, selection there. So uh, uh, we just take a few of that uh, uh, genes that uh, was inside these regions of uh, 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 showing insertions of deletions and, and perform again uh, enrichment analysis. And, and we found some nice patterns here that some specific uh, uh, function uh, are more like uh, restricted to some specific areas. For example, these uh, these these uh, functions here or functional and enrichment genes are more restricted to the highlands, the, to the South Highland populations, and some more to the to the coastal populations. So uh, I guess. And find a, um, a good match between the the outliers and and, and these structural variations will provide us uh, good ideas about the uh, the evolution of uh, genes uh, or providing a adapt, a local adaptation there uh, in a gene network uh, perspective. So from, from these uh, genes that uh, were, were found inside the uh, structural variants, uh, we already uh, like catch some possible or interesting uh, candidates related with uh, abiotic or biotic stress uh, that are like a good candidates of uh, like uh, 
uh, evolution of gene families there uh, in our data sets. So this uh, like genom genomic uh, approach is, is like a, when you uh, know nothing about the species and you basically sequence the, 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 the genomes and, and, and try to catch different uh, outlier um, signals there. That is, is kind of a, a naive approach. But also, since we are working with a, a modern group, that is the, the tomato group, we also can use many different uh, secondary information uh, to try to identify this network evolution. So uh, for, for this reason, we started to also uh, make like a secondary or, or alternative uh, project here that is uh, based on target sequencing. And for this specific uh, project, uh, we did a more like a compre comprehensive sampling here, here and based uh, and taking into account uh, like landscape um, features. So uh, we sample now for this project uh, 200 uh, individuals from 18 populations. But uh, the special thing is that these populations are distributed in four different valleys trying to catch these uh, environmental gradients here from the coastal to the highland conditions. Uh, and also uh, we complete this uh, um, sampling with some scattered individuals in the divergent uh, regions. For this specific project, uh, we uh, target um, around 2,500 uh, genes uh, related with different um, uh, pathways here. So some of them are related with drought that derived with some for some with some previous analysis of uh, transcript uh, transcript analysis. Uh, same for the for the cold genes that uh, that cold uh, tolerance genes was assessed in some transcriptomic approach by um, a, a former colleague of us. Uh, we catch another genes that uh, were were described uh, in in the cultivated tomato. For example, some salinity tolerance uh, genes, and, and, and also these uh, self incompatibility genes were taken for, with uh, some transcriptome analysis involved with uh, Solanum chilense and Solanum pimpinelli folium. Uh, the NLR uh, genes that uh, we studied uh, before um, and a set of um, genes involved in, in, in secondary compounds the, that uh, was kindly provided by uh, Federico Roa. Um, and so, uh, we include some uh, control and candidate genes from a previous study and to get a neutral control. Uh, we just also sequence uh, some interregenic regions to get like uh, the, the the neutral polymorphisms. So this is this project is just in the beginning. I can show you some preliminary results uh, from these neutral or these intergenic uh, regions uh, in the different uh, populations here. Uh, we found this like a uh, nicely shaped uh, site frequency spectrum for most of them, except for especially these two populations that show kind of weird pattern here, especially these three that um, um, by look or by, lo by look is, uh, are located in the, in the same gradient. So if you see like this uh, population one, two or three in this valley are this gradient here from the coastal to the highland. Um, and we found, for example, we can just describe or uh, check these patterns here. For example, this is an, an interesting pattern here uh, of the change of the site frequency, um, uh, suggesting, for example, in, in these three bottom populations here, some expansion, is, uh, expansion signal where these, like, the singletons are more frequent than the others. So this is something that could suggest that the, the, the the process, a process of expansion from the south, from the coastal to the highlands here. Um, I also can show you this uh, basic genetic structure analysis uh, for two different uh, like groups here. 
and for this K4, we can nicely hit the, the, the structure of, of the four valleys that we sample. This is the, the valley more in the north. These two valleys that are very close together come from a, a single group. That is the valley two and three. And one population in the valley three seems to be like a little bit more uh, like related or uh, share more, have more similar yeah, allelic frequencies with um, with individuals here in the um, in the in the in, in the fourth valley, and these are different uh, like the group of the different individuals from the coast and the highland. So we can see here in this K six, this also these two populations that has I showed you before that had this weird um, SFS. It also seems to 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 cluster together in a single uh, like cluster of populations. So we suspect that there is something strange in these two populations uh, in, in the data there. So um, we also already analyzed the polymorphisms in the, in the uh, 236 genes related uh, uh, with uh, pathogen resistance. And we found like a very, uh, like a smooth pattern of genetic and diversity, except for these the two weird populations, and also the coastal population seems to be lower, uh, show lower uh, genetic diversity that agrees uh, with our genome data. So until that uh, is okay. Um, you see an, an approach of the novel assembly of each of the genes. Uh, we also found some specific genes, a small set of uh, four, six, seven, like around nine genes that show an uh, interesting pattern of um, absence in some spe specific populations. So here you can see all the individuals that we, in, in the, in the x-axis, all the individuals that we sequence. Uh, for example, uh, that specific gene seems to be like absent in most of the individuals in the divergent uh, coastal and highland populations. So for example, this specific gene here that seems to be more absent in the southernmost populations. So that can be a good approach of this um, uh, evolution of the presence absence of the genes depending on some specific environment of the species. So finally, to put a little bit more complex in our, in our project, we uh, also want to uh, understand some possible uh, life trait evolution during the colonization processes. Uh, we want to target uh, the trait about the uh, seed dormancy, mainly because there is a previous work showing that there is a, could be some change in the, in the seed dormancy or the germination rate in the populations. Uh, from the Solanum Peruvianum and Solanum Chilense. So this uh, work from the professor Tellier in 2011 showed that um, using an approximate Bayesian computation, it shows that the models included a uh, seed bank uh, are uh, better supported than those uh, demographic uh, models that do doesn't include the seed bank. And also show this um, um, estimation of the germination rate that uh, uh, is the germination rate or the length or the length of the seed bank could be higher in Solanum Peruvianum, that is this uh, higher uh, group here than Solanum Chilense. So at the, uh, the beginning can show that if you move to, towards the south, uh, you tend to have less seed bank here. This is the main uh, message here. So for this, uh, um, a specific, uh, 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 I don't know, um, uh, project about the the life trait, the interaction of the of the life traits like germination rate and, and the estimation of demographic parameters. Uh, there was one st a, stu a student working in our group, um, extending the, the the models of the. Uh, SM, the SMC models to try to incorporate uh, the estimation of uh, seed bank and selfing uh, to 
uh, improved estimations of the of the demographic parameters like population size or 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 divergence time. So uh, he finally shows that if you include um, um, parameters in, in of, for example, in this case of, of germination rate, uh, when uh, the species really have it, uh, uh, you can get re reliable estimations that if you ex exclude it from the estimation. So we want to apply it in our data, but for that it's very important uh, to have like a, a good reference genome for the same species. So uh, we basically started working on that on, on generate a new version of the uh, genome of the Solan Chilense. We already have a, a draft uh, assembly, uh, but uh, it's very important to have a very like a large and continuous sequences there. So we um, work it in the um, scaffolding this uh, this this uh, old um, assembly, uh, and we managed to 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 get a new version uh, that that has comes from eighty one thousand to twelve thousand scaffolds, but um, uh, most of the uh, most of the like uh, scaffold were assembled to a chromosome. Um, length, so it's applicable for our method now. So basically I can show you here like um, a, a mapping of, uh, of the scaffolds, the biggest scaffolds of the new reference uh, toward the, um, the recent, the most recent Solan Penelite genome uh, that we can see like a, a, good, a good continuity of uh, our assembly. Uh, we also uh, uh, did um, gene annotation and T annotation that we need to input that data for our estimations. And um, I just map it uh, back our, our, our genome, all genome samples included an, a new population from the south. And, and we found like um, a similar pattern of a genome. This is like a, a, a SNP density uh, uh, of different uh, chromosome for the whole data set and we can see that they, we can uh, that like a, a nice smooth uh, um, distribution of the of the uh, SNP density that is around um, 50 SNPs per, per kb in our species. So using that data we rerun the um, um, demography est uh, estimations for our species um, we can see here the, the estimation of the um, effective population size. So the, the three top uh, plots here uh, are the three populations from the um, from the central from the central group, and it mainly shows that the the population size in the time is like uh, quite uh, constant there, uh, and the signals of the uh, of the other divergent populations, these two, uh, the, the second uh, panel here in the middle uh, are the two uh, populations from the, um, from, from the highland region. Uh, so you can see here, this decrease of the population sizes are showing us the more or less the, the, the time of the, of the colonization, that have like a, a decrease of the population size during the colonization processes. And the two coastal populations that are the two bottom um, plots here uh, are showing some interesting patterns here that uh, there are like a big decrease, a highly decrease of the, of the population size, but also if we see uh, some differences between um, the estimations using a single individual, all the color lines here are uh, estimation versus on using only one individual, uh, that means two haplotypes. Uh, and the, the black line shows the, the estimations using uh, the, the, the complete population that are uh, 10 haplotypes, five individuals. So these populations here, the uh, 2932, is showing some like the part, a strong depart here from the two estimations that could be showing like some internal structure. Uh, like substructure in the population, but could be also uh, show one, uh, could be uh, related with another issues in, in the data. 
uh, also, and then uh, using this uh, same data, uh, we apply it the Tibot's method to estimate the the germination rate in the in the populations, and we show uh, a nice pattern here where all the populations from from the central group, all these populations of the red points here that. Uh, we think that this is the, the area of uh, the origin uh, of the Solanum chilense uh, shows um, lower germination rates. That means that I have more, have more seed bank than all the populations, uh, the divergent populations from the, from the highland and, and the coast. Um, we can also see here that this estimation of the of the germination rate uh, have more variability in the populations in the south uh, that can be shown like more um, this each of the points is the estimation using uh, the different chromosomes of, from our from our genome uh, and it can uh, this variability can show like uh, that some chromosome uh, specific uh, patterns that it could be related uh, with uh, selection or also like there is more variation in the in the polymorphins re related with the germination rate that could be uh, show like some uh, related with the more recent uh, recent divergence and but for example here in the southernmost population we can see here a, a, like a strong shift uh, of, the, of this germination rate, there is like a strong differences between the, these coastal populations and the central population, showing that there is some decrease of the of the seed banks there in the south. So, what could be the considerations of these differences uh, of this like a left right evolution during the colonization processes? So, we can think about it, what what could be the advantage to have like. Um, and more seed banks in the central region, uh, we can uh, think that this towards uh, the north, the, the, um, there could be more variability uh, in the environment in the uh, towards the year or, or more temporal variability in the in the climatic conditions, and the populations uh, needs to preserve some like a uh, uh, backup of uh, diversity to accommodate or, or to adapt to different conditions in different times there. But also there could be another, like a more spatial uh, advantage there, that if there are more variability, uh, spatial variability there, to be able to colonize uh, some regions, you need to have like a, some uh, high uh, or better gene pool there to be able to colonize uh, envir different environments. And also from the south, that for, uh, if we see what could be the advantage to have um, less seed bank there, um, it could be in, uh, beneficial to increase the local adaptation because you have like less variation there uh, from generation to generation is easier or, or you can fix faster the beneficial uh, mutations there. So. These um, results are interesting, uh, thinking about uh, the, the climatic stochasticity of the area uh, related with the El Nino phenomena. Uh, and we can see here that uh, the, strong inf the stronger influence of the El Nino um, like change just closing in the, in, the, in, the, in the area of the distribution of the, of the Solanum chilense meaning that maybe most northern population have a stronger influence of El Nino than southern populations. So this is something that we want to test now. Uh, and for that, we are planning some common garden experiments trying to simulate in road chambers um, El, um, different El Nino or La Nina regimes compared to average condition based on data from weather stations in Peru and Chile and try to check the response uh, of the plants in gene expression, expression and also in, in phenotyping. So this is it will be our common experiments in, in, for the next year. So uh, to finish that, I want to acknowledge to 
and all the people here in the population genetic group, especially the Professor Aurelien Tellier that give me several opportunities to develop this nice project and all the people, the students that are, are, have been involved in, in, in our project and all the sponsors. And, and finally, since uh, uh, the, we are like uh, as a human beings, we also need the support of uh, other people. Uh, and this in this time, I want to uh, acknowledge my wife, uh, Lina Caballero. Uh, she's also a young researcher like, like me. Uh, and as you can see, it's around six. So to be able to be here, uh, she's taking some of my responsibilities at home. So uh, we, uh, since without her, her support, uh, I cannot be uh, here uh, giving this talk and uh, making this nice project. So for that reason, uh, I want to share you this important project that, that she's developing now. Uh, that is uh, Parent Sciences in Colombia. She's uh, collaborating with many people in Latin America to understand and to really record what is the impact of having child uh, uh, in, in our careers. And so I think that this project is very, very important and I encourage you to uh, take the surveys available there and also to, to support them because uh, this, we need this data to really understand uh, this, these issues there and to improve our, our science community. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Gustavo, uh, for sh sharing all your knowledge about Solano, Soleno Chilense and from all people in Munich working in this nice project. Uh, was very productive to learn about all these novel approaches to study the adaptation of species to new environments. Uh, now we have time for questions. Uh, please, if someone uh, had a question, you want to on your microphone or use the test bot in Zoom. Okay, we have some comments in the, in the test box. Uh, so many congratulations for you, for your presentation. Uh, no have questions? Sorry, it's not people. Right. Gustavo, hi. Uh, let me hi. get it to the light. Great talk, thanks. I hadn't seen half of this work, so I'm really happy to uh, to see this really good uh, stuff. And we definitely should talk about our genes more uh, in the future, but I will not bother the audience about that. <laughs> what I what I wondered, um, you showed when you went a bit deeper. It was more at the beginning of your talk. You showed that the, the coastal populations generally have uh, are are more diversified, right, in the south, the southern coastal population. Yeah, more differentiated. Yeah. But for some reason, you find a lot less genes when you look for sweeps. How do you explain this? Like what? what yeah, no, not exactly less genes. Yeah, this is a very tricky thing uh, because uh, since uh, we have to uh, use uh, demographic simulations uh, to set up some cutoff to, to, to catch the outliers there. And since these populations has less variability and a lot of drift, of course, this um, could off uh, get higher. So it's more difficult since there is like a more, um, how can I say, more fixation in these populations because there are more drift, the, the population size are lower, and there are less diversity. Okay. Uh, it's more difficult to, to catch or to differentiate the outliers uh, from the rest because there is a lot of early fixation just by drift. So it's more tricky to, to catch uh, outliers of positive selection in the coast, be just because uh, there are less variability, more fixation. Uh, but also there is another like alternative. Uh, this is something that is a, a tricky question there because uh, we know that these populations diverge first, they are more like early divergence. So maybe these signals of positive selection are already broken by the recombination in, in tomato in solar chiles. We have a very high uh, recombination rate. So these blocks, we need to find, to be able to catch the outliers. We need like a long blocks of low diversity. 
and since it takes more time there, it's it just more like, a, I don't know, broken up these blocks and it's more difficult to identify them. Okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, we had a question here from Iris Peralta from Argentina. Uh, she says that uh, was a very interesting presentation, Gustavo. Uh, she's asking about what do you think, do you think that Solenum uh, Guayalacense could have been originated from ancient migration of Solenum Chilense population? <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting question. We was discussing about that because yeah, we have, I guess, while the sense is also a highland, uh, it colonized the highlands, and it could yes. also diverse from Peruviano as well as Chilense. So uh, when we got these results from this divergence between Peruviano and Chilense, and we still can get like a very conclusive ones, we think that we are still missing some a sampling there of, of Wild Sense because there could be like the either the the the, the divergence of Wild Sense or Chilense or both could be related with some like gene flow between them to be able to catch some like uh, beneficial genes to climb up in the in the mountains. So yeah this is a very relevant question and we want to include some data for Wild Sense to to really understand how is this process of colonization from a coastal, uh, like uh, a parent that is the, uh, the, the Peruviano toward the, the south, to, toward the highlands there, that is uh, the cases of, of Chilean San Juan Yes, uh, thank you, Gustavo. And also the um, distribution of Wild Asensi is very restrictive, it's endemic to the Rio Santa in Ancash. So they found recently more populations in, in this area, but it's, it's, it, it has a very narrow distribution. So pro probably it's a very ancient relic of uh, northern migrations. This could be very interesting to test. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that mm -hmm. comment. Yeah, we well, definitely are very interested to incorporate uh, in, in, in the divergent scenario of Chilense, uh, the possibility or the influence of Puebla Sense there because there, there could be some possibility of gene flow between them and there could be like strong influence in the, in the adaptation to the highlands there. That's very interesting. And, yeah. and also I noticed that you have in your candidate genes, uh, one related the histone methylation so I remember your question <laughs> about the epigenetic phenomena. So do you think that also for the migration and adaptation, it could be also epigenetic phenomena that allow the populations to, to be adapted? Yeah, of course. Yeah, this is a very important like, uh, dimension there that I'm completely neglecting in these uh, gen genomics approaches there. Uh, but yeah, I guess this is some interesting thing that we still have like basically no idea how it works. But of course, there could be a strong influence there in this environmental adaptation to like new environments and also in this stochasticity related, for example, with El Nino or, or related phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Iris, for your questions. Uh, we had a question from Richard Olmsted here, but I can see Richard. Richard, you can. Can you, what, do you want to go ahead with your question? Oh. Okay. Um, Gustavo, that was a very interesting talk. A ton of data. Uh, it, I, I'd like to spend more time with it sometime, read some of those papers. Um, you, in the last section, you talked about seed, seed bank, and you used low germination rate as a proxy for greater amount of higher seed bank, presumably meaning that fewer will germinate in the first year and therefore there's more that are persisting in the gene bank. Can you discriminate that from uh, simply a higher proportion of non-viable seeds that might be due to inbreeding depression or something? Did you do multiple years of germination studies to show that there continued to be, they continue to be viable after that first year? 
No, unfortunately, we have no data about, say, like uh, germination experiments. Uh, this is some of the projects that we have in mind now to really take seeds uh, from the plants here in the, gra in, the, in the glass houses and start this germination and also play around with different conditions, leaks, for example, this vernalization. But yeah, unfortunately, this is, uh, I have no data right now uh, of this uh, like phenotypic data. We are trying just to, to, to catch these uh, patterns uh, like in an evolutionary scale using the, the, the genomic data. But of course, it could be interesting and we need this information. So let's hope if in the near future we can just run some experiments to, to understand better how, how is the process. We also, for example, just saw a small insight. Um, there is also a, a, already some observations in the differences of the, of the, of the, of the, of the size of the seeds. Uh, and there is some change from seeds that are uh, smaller seeds seems to show more um, and have more, have more in the seeds bank and, and the, all the populations or species that have bigger, bigger seeds has less seed bank. So this is some uh, uh, trait that is like a congruent thing um, and, and this observation that toward the south there are bigger seeds and less seed bank. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay. Uh, we had a, a related question here in the, in the test box uh, from Patricia Bedinger. Uh, she said that it was a nice talk and, and she's also wondered about the seed, seed pan estimation. What is the biological feature that they are based on? Can seed bands be actually measured? Yeah, Patricia is here too. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's a more direct way to measure a seed bank in in vivo in on site. Is there a way to do that? Because I agree um, that it's quite an indirect measurement about whether seeds will germinate or whether they will never germinate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This estimation here is based uh, on two patterns in the genome, that is the, the recombination, a uh, relationship between the recombination rate and the mutation rate. So you expect some specific um, uh, relationship, uh, like taking into account the, the real recombination and mutation, the, the molecular one. So if there is some cheap, some differences in this, in this, in this, um, in these two quantities, for example, if you have, if you depart, for example, for a higher mutation than recombination in the, in the estimation with the genome data, that could be that there are some accumulating of some mutations. So that, that's accumulation of the mutations uh, that could be related with some like back hanging because there are, the seeds become more time that specific individual in the seed, in the seed because, uh, or, or lives for longer in the seed, including the, the, the under, under soil and above soil. And this extra mutation that we observe there uh, leaves us the possibility to, to, to infer this uh, possibility of the, of the ger difference germination rate. I, I know it was clear there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay. And may, may okay. I inter because you were asking also about in in vivo determination of seed banks, right, Patricia? Right, right. So I have no clue how to do this. That's what you're what you're asking as well, right? So I went. Oh, I was there. asking. Yeah, I don't know if there is. Like, can you sift the soil and then just count the seeds? Is that is that realistic? Well, I, I guess and then see if they germinate. <laughs> I mean, I went, I went there in 2019, just after floods and, and the whole area, especially in the central region, it was full of very tiny germinating tomato plants. So, I mean, there is there are really thousands in a square meter sometimes, but dependent where you look. So if you look left, there are a thousand tiny plantlets. And if you look right, there is absolutely zero. So this is, this is an extremely daunting task, I guess, to do this in vivo. Um, I'd love to hear of people who have better suggestions and also of people who would be able to allow permits to actually take the seeds home and analyze them then because that's the second problem. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> 
But it's, it, yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot after I've been there and I, I don't have the answer on how to realistically in vivo determine this. So I'm glad that Gustavo can do it computationally actually. <laughs> Well, I think that one way you could approach this, and this could be something that could be done in country rather than having to remove the seeds uh, from Peru or, or wherever, is to uh, gather seeds and then over a series of years, uh, set some out to see what germination rate you get. And okay. in some cases, you might get all of them germinating in the first year. In some cases, you might only get a portion and then the second year that from that same population, a similar portion or a smaller portion. So you'd get, you could see an attenuation of germination rate over time. Yeah, and that, and that would be a proxy. Populations. Because that won't tell you much about the genetic diversity of your seed bank, but you can imply it from that, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That would imply that there's a collection for, uh, uh, reduce germination, immediate germination. And that's known from a lot of different plants that there's differences in germination rate <clears throat> and selection has caused that. Mm -hmm. So would you, because that's my last, my other question that I didn't want to ask the both question at the same time, but I wonder also about this different, this phenomenon. Because I will hypothesize a little bit, would any of you have an idea of why there would be a lower germination rate in the South? Like it's drier there. So it's, it's the opposite there, uh, like there is less seed bank, seed bank towards the south. So the seed banks are smaller, but that means, and the germination rate is higher. Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. There are like a more synchronicity <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the generations there, let's when say. would such a thing evolve when, when there are fewer extreme events and at the moment there is an extreme event, like this, this very rare rain, much rarer than in the north. If the very rare rain happens, you do need to germinate, is that kind of? I think that's right. I think that most of the studies, the ones I'm familiar with are done in Mediterranean zones, such as in California, but they associate um, low germination rate with plants that live in very highly variable environments. Yeah. So that from temporally variable, so that they won't all germinate if you get a sudden rain followed by a uh, long period of drought. Whereas lots of plants in tropical wet environments where, where temporal variation environment is very low, uh, germination rate often is high and everything germinates in the first season. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And more or less that's we uh, more expect uh, here more toward the south. There was, could be, for example, more influence of El Nino phenomena or more st stochasticity in the in the in the environmental conditions that in the south could be even it's really harsh there, like a very dry or a lot of salinity, but it could be the conditions are more constant there. And the other issue, important issue there is that uh, these local adaptation processes. Once uh, if, if you favor more the local adaptation processes, you need like more less varia variation there in the in the gene pool to be able to really fix these variants that are beneficial uh, locally. So in that case, the, the, the seed bank is not very beneficial and could be favorite, uh, could be unfavorite in the, in, the, in the southern populations. One thing, Gustavo, is uh, along the coast of uh, southern Peru and also northern Chile, you have the Camanchacas. Those are mm -hmm. a natural phenomena, the humidity from the sea. So if you look for populations in very narrow valleys, uh, very close to the coast, they usually have more humidity. So the, the, you, you expect that the environment won't be so heterogeneous. So you can find more constant uh, humidity or temperature. And that's happened to many, many other plants in the coastal range. Not only white tomatoes. Yeah, so great. another thing that I have been thinking that you can also take seeds from herbarium specimens because the fruits can be maintained for a long time. 
And this could be like a test uh, of uh, how long they can germinate. Mm -hmm. Say a, a specimen that you collected 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we had a, another question from Amanda. Uh, she said that okay. uh, uh, Amanda is here. I can ask okay. my question. Okay. Uh, oh, I was curious about SINSC, I guess, in your populations. Sorry? At okay. self incompatibility in your populations and how that impacts genetic diversity. Yeah, this, um, we didn't measure directly the self incompatibility, but uh, we assume that the four species or most of the individuals are self incompatible. And of course, that has a huge impact in the diversity. And, and that's sure. why so many variants have a very high SNP density there. Like we can find, I don't know, let's say 20 uh, SNPs every, I don't know, 10. 100 base pairs, so they, they, it's huge the amount of variation there also in, in indels and, and this uh, like have a, a strong um, um, effect in many uh, of the potential like uh, genomic signatures there um, especially for example to try to find like a, this uh, Features, for example, balancing selection. It's mm -hmm. very, very interesting because uh, the species itself has a, a lot of variation there, and it's just like a good subject or, or a very good trait to to enhance these patterns of uh, balancing selection. So this is one of the, our like great questions that we want to to assess. Do you have estimation of population sizes and say the coastal? Accessions. I don't. I haven't looked in TTRC yeah, much the, at all about it, chill and see. Yeah, yeah. This the species wide uh, effective population size uh, is something between like uh, around uh, fifty thousand, something, something like that. Yes, huge. Huge. That is huge. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, thank you for your question. Thank you. I think this is uh, all questions. Um, and this is all for today. Thank you so much, uh, Gustavo, for your nice presentation. And thank you everyone for, for these questions. Um, see you next week on, on October 16 to attend to the talk of Margaret Frank, the, uh, who we talk us about the molecular basis for graph compatible combination in Solanese. Uh, also, we had a last announcement uh, about the uh, International Solanese meeting that is, is, is very soon. Maybe if Sandy is still here, maybe no, <laughs> uh, can help me a little bit with the with that announcement. I'm here. Just just register <laughs> for the meeting, even if you're not going to talk or give a poster. It's going to be really interesting, and they're short talks, so it'll be sh uh, lots and lots of short talks. And we're particularly interested in getting um, abstracts from early career researchers or people who've never been to one of these Solanaceae e genomics meetings before ever, because I want new voices in that forum. So help me, guys. Thank you. Sounds good. We're all registered. <laughs>